This is NTD Evening News. Live from our global headquarters in New York City, here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Israel attacked a government building in southern Lebanon today, killing local officials. And in the Gaza Strip, Israel allowed 50 more aid trucks to enter. That's after pressure from the U.S. to improve humanitarian conditions there. Entity's international correspondent, Arian Pazdar, has a Middle East update. Israel launched an airstrike on the municipal headquarters of a major town in South Lebanon. Lebanese authorities say the attack killed the mayor and at least five others. Israel's military says it hit dozens of Hezbollah targets in the area and dismantled underground infrastructure. Israel had also issued an evacuation order for the town before the strikes. The White House on Wednesday said it spoke with Israel about its operation in Lebanon. We have been really clear. It is critical. It is critical that these operations be conducted in a way, in a way that does not threaten the lives of civilians. The Israeli defense minister defends the operations in Lebanon. Hundreds or even thousands of missiles came from this area across the entire zone. It shows us what situation we have been in. Also on Wednesday, the Israeli army says a barrage of around 30 rockets crossed from Lebanon into Israel. The majority of them were intercepted by Israeli air defense systems. And video released by Israel appears to show more humanitarian aid headed to northern Gaza on Wednesday. Officials say the shipment includes 50 trucks with medical supplies, shelter equipment and more. Israel's UN ambassador said this on Wednesday. The problem in Gaza is not lack of aid. The problem is Hamas, which hijacks the aid, stealing, storing and selling it to feed their terror machine while civilians suffer. The shipment comes after the U.S. urged Israel to allow more aid into Gaza. Reports say the U.S. plans to withhold military aid if Israel doesn't comply. On Wednesday, the State Department once again declined confirming those reports. I, a year, uh, as I said, a year. this is not a letter that we intended to make public. We intended to discuss public. I understand it is public, and so it is very fair for you to ask questions about it. Um, but when it comes to those implications, we're going to have those conversations privately with the government of Israel. He added that he hopes Israel complies with the demands so that the U.S. won't have to take any action. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today finally presenting what he calls a victory plan. This comes as Russian troops advance in the east and the winter months approach. Ukraine's partners have already been presented with this plan of ours. They approached it very practically and carefully. Our teams are now focused on details for effective support. A Kremlin spokesperson says that it's too early to comment in detail on Zelensky's plan, but added that Kyiv needs to, quote, sober up and realize the futility of the policies. The spokesperson also said the Ukrainian plan was probably similar to the U.S. plan. He described this as the U.S. using Kyiv to fight Russia until the last Ukrainian. The Kremlin suggests Washington is fighting a proxy war against Russia via Ukraine. Remembering Ethel Kennedy, the widow of former Senator Robert F. Kennedy and sister-in-law of former President John F. Kennedy. Today, President Biden, former presidents and loved ones were among hundreds at her memorial service in Washington, D.C. Entities Jack Bradley has the details. President Biden, as well as former presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, spoke about Ethel Kennedy's enduring spirit at her eulogy. As soon as I got elected president, uh, I received a letter from your mom. The letter here was titled Mrs. Robert Kennedy. And in her very neat handwriting, she had written that she took great comfort in knowing the country was in good hands. And days later, I received another letter from her. It was a picture of me and Ethel surrounded by hearts. Oh, you think I'm kidding. It meant a lot to me, I'm telling you. Printed the language on the card, it said, in the printed language of the card, it said, I'm not biding my time waiting for you, Valentine. (laughs) And then in her handwriting, she says, because he's no ordinary Joe. 
I don't know how many got that damn Valentine, but I'll tell you what, it meant a lot to me. Her life was marked by more tragedy and heartbreak than most of us could bear. And she would have been forgiven, I think, if at any point she had stepped away from public life or allowed bitterness to fester after all she and her family had been through. But that is not what Ethel did because that's not who she was. Nobody should be this upbeat having been through everything she has. She was a national treasure. We all know that. And a matriarch of a great family. Ethel Kennedy raised 11 children after her husband was assassinated back in 1968 during his presidential campaign. She was active in social causes until her death last Thursday. She was 96. She established the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, and she was honored the Presidential Medal of Freedom by former President Obama for her human rights work. One of her sons, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., ran for president in 2024, initially as a Democrat, then as an independent. He then dropped out of the race in August and endorsed former President Donald Trump. In the evening, President Biden and the First Lady are giving remarks at a reception here at the White House honoring Italian American Heritage Month. Then the president is heading over to Germany to meet with officials where they'll discuss supporting Ukraine in its war with Russia, as well as combating anti-Semitism. Reporting from the White House, Jack Bradley, NTD News. Just hours ago, Vice President Kamala Harris was joined by over 100 Republicans at a rally in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. NTD's correspondent Jason Blair brings us highlights from the event. In Battleground, Pennsylvania, Vice President Kamala Harris is making her case to win more Republican and independent voters on board with her campaign to the White House. I've mentioned many of you know, I spent a career as a prosecutor in law enforcement, and I will tell you, I never asked a victim or a witness, are you a Republican? Or are you a Democrat? Over 100 Republicans joined her in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, a swing county that Biden won by 17,000 votes in 2020. One of the Republicans joining her is former Illinois Representative Adam Kinzinger. Democracy knows no party. Democracy is a living, breathing ideal that defines us as a nation. Vice President Harris said on stage that the Constitution is on the line in this election. We are here today because we share a core belief that we must put country before party. Early voting started Tuesday in the county located northeast of Philadelphia. In another swing state, the Michigan Firefighters Union did say they will not endorse a presidential candidate, which is in line with its federal organization, who did the same. This comes as a blow to Harris, as the campaign was hoping to secure the endorsement. And back to Pennsylvania, poll averages are showing that the state is virtually tied with Trump up by only 0.3%. So we can probably expect to see a lot more campaign action from both candidates in the Keystone State. Reporting in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Jason Blair, NTD News. Former President Trump pitching to female and Latino voters in two different town halls. It comes as Elon Musk is set to stump for Trump in the key swing state of Pennsylvania. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Making his pitch to women voters, former President Trump in a Fox News town hall aired on Wednesday, featuring a female audience, vows to bring down energy bills and ban trans women in female sports. We stop it. We stop it. We absolutely stop it. You can't have it. It's a man playing in the game. I mean, physically. Trump also again took credit for overturning Roe versus Wade, but he also voiced support for individual fertilization, revealing that Senator Katie Britt explained the procedure to him after an Alabama judge ruled the IVF clinics illegal. And within about two minutes, I understood it. I said, no, no, we're totally in favor of IVF. I came out with a statement within an hour, a really powerful statement with some experts, really powerful, and we, we went totally in favor, the Republican Party, the whole party. But Vice President Kamala Harris firing back, calling Trump's comments bizarre. I found it to be quite bizarre, actually. He called himself the father of IVF. 
And if what he meant is taking responsibility, well, then yeah, he should take responsibility for that. Trump on Wednesday also taped a Univision town hall to be aired at 10 p.m. on Wednesday in an appeal to Latino voters. Harris's campaign releasing a new ad also targeting that demographic. I was raised by a working mother. That'll teach you about hard work, too. Meanwhile, Elon Musk says he's hosting a series of talks in Pennsylvania this week to stump for Trump. The ex-owning billionaire says there's no attendance fee, but to get in, people will need to sign a petition supporting free speech and the right to bear arms and have voted in this election. Reporting by Iris Tao, NTD News. Special counsel Jack Smith is pushing to keep the obstruction charge in Trump's election interference case. Today, Smith told a federal judge the Supreme Court ruling on how prosecutors bring obstruction charges should not apply to Trump. The ruling narrowed how the Justice Department could use a felony obstruction charge to prosecute January 6 rioters. As a result, obstruction charges against a handful of the defendants were dropped. Trump's legal teams, the same, should apply to the former president and asked to have all his charges dismissed. But Smith argues Trump's obstruction charge should stand because of his push to have fraudulent electoral college votes certified. He said that links his actions on January 6th directly to his efforts to obstruct the certification proceeding. The special counsel also argued Trump is accused of creating false evidence through a plot to insert fake electors in the certification process. The family of Lyle and Eric Menendez are calling for their release. Prosecutors are reviewing the brothers' convictions for the 1989 murders of their parents. Earlier this month, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office announced that it would be re-evaluating the case. NTD's Christina Corona tells us more from Los Angeles. We're here in downtown Los Angeles where the extended family of Eric and Lyle Menendez held a news conference to advocate for the brothers' release from prison. Prosecutors are reviewing new evidence to decide whether they should remain serving life sentences for the murders of their parents. The Menendez brothers fatally shot their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez, at their Beverly Hills home in 1989. While they have never denied killing their parents, both men argued during their trial that they acted in self-defense after enduring years of physical and sexual abuse by their father. Now, over a dozen family members united in support of the brothers' release. Lyle and Eric would continue to be victimized. They would be victims of a system that wouldn't hear them. And they would be victims of a culture that was not ready to listen. They would be mocked. They would be called cold-blooded killers, left to rot in jail and denied any hope of redemption. Kitty's sister, Joanne Anderson Vandermolen, spoke about the abuse to her nephews. Lyle and Eric have already paid a heavy price, discarded by a system that failed to recognize their pain. They have grown, they have changed, and they have become better men, despite everything that they've been through. It's time to give them the opportunity to. Their attorney, Mark Garrigo, said there's new evidence to review in the case. At least part of the two prongs of new evidence were, number one, a letter that was found at Marta Kano's house that was a letter written by Eric fully eight months before the killings to his cousin Andy. His cousin Andy testified at the trial. However, in the second trial, was demeaned as making this up or was not true. The letter describes the abuse. Roy Rosello, who was a member or a then member of the band Menudo, was and took great courage at Nuri's uh, finding him and talking to him to sign a declaration that said that he too was assaulted by um, the, uh, the father and not only assaulted, but it happened at the house. The conference comes less than two weeks after LA County District Attorney George Gascon announced his office was re-examining the case. Eric, now 53, and Lyle, 56, are currently serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. Reporting from downtown Los Angeles, Christina Corona, NTD News. At the Election Data Hub is NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, with just 20 days left until the election, a lot of the focus has been on the battleground state of Pennsylvania. What are the polls showing now, and what do you see as being the difference in this state? 
Thank you, Tiv. Yeah, this is a big one here. 19 electoral votes up for grabs in Pennsylvania. That is the most among the seven swing states. Let's take a look at some recent polls here and see how it's going. This is an Emerson College poll just dated earlier this month. So you can see here Donald Trump with a one point lead over Kamala Harris, well within the margin of error of 3%. Now, if we rewind four years, look at the actual election results. Joe Biden won this by just 1% over Donald Trump. That was just by 80,000 votes here in 2020. Now, uh, as for what could make the difference this time around, I mean, it could be a number of things. Let's, start, let's take a look at some demographics, actually starting with race. Let's take a look at the black vote. In 2020, as you can see here, Joe Biden took 92% of the black vote as compared to Trump, Donald Trump's 7%. Now that's according to Edison Research, that's 2020 exit polls. So there's an 85% uh, margin there in 2020. Now fast forward four years, Kamala Harris, an 81% lead over Donald Trump. So it looks pretty small. I mean, it's just a four point swing here in favor of Donald Trump. But this demographic represents probably 11% of the nearly 7 million voters that voted in 2020. A 4% swing actually equals 30,000 votes. Now that wouldn't have been enough to swing the election, but at least it would have made a dent in it four years ago. Let's take a look at a dem another demographic here. Male voters. 2020, Trump had an 11 point lead over Biden in this category. Fast forward four years and it's only 14% here. So that's just a three point bump here for uh, Donald Trump. But 47% of the nearly 7 million voters are male. A three point bump equals 90,000 voters. Again, now this is actually more than the 80,000 that Joe Biden wanted by uh, four years ago. Let's take a look at another one here. How about age group? Let's look at 30 something year olds. In 2020, Joe Biden had a 24 point lead in this demographic. Fast forward four years and Kamala Harris's lead is down to 15%. Now that's not a huge advantage there, but it is a nine point favor uh, in favor of Donald Trump, a nine point swing in favor of Donald Trump. Now, if this demographic is 16% of the nearly 7 million, this 9% represents nearly 100,000 voters. That is more than the 80,000 uh, that Joe Biden won to buy in 2020. So Tiff, this state is so close that even these small three, 4% swings can really make the difference in Pennsylvania. Back to you at the desk. All right, Dave, thanks for breaking that down for us. And staying in Pennsylvania, a final fierce debate was held last night between the state's two Senate candidates, a three-term senator and a businessman with ties to Washington, D.C. And today's Melina Weisskopf has a report. The debate around abortion is moving further to the left, which was on full display in that Pennsylvania Senate debate last night. We have the Democrat Senator Bob Casey, who once had a more reserved stance on abortion access, now embracing access to it. We also see a shift on the Republican side, with Republicans now taking a step back and refusing the premise of a national abortion ban. You've described yourself as a pro-life Democrat for many years, but more recently you've taken a stronger stance in favor of abortion rights, particularly after the Dobbs decision. Can you explain to voters what prompted the shift in your stance? Sherry, in 2022, the Supreme Court overturned a 49-year right. I think most Americans believe that our daughters shouldn't have fewer rights than their mothers or their grandmothers. And, um, and I believe that it's so polarizing that courts shouldn't decide, judges shouldn't decide, people should decide. And there's very different views across, across states. So I believe it's a and it's not just Senate candidate David McCormick. This has been a broader strategy by Republicans. They've actually taken the national abortion ban policy out of their agenda. As for immigration, both candidates at last night's debate said that there needs to be more done on border security, but they sparred over what caused the lack of action over the past four years. Because border security is critically important, number one. We have to secure our border. That means hiring more border patrol. That means investing a lot more in the technology that will stop fentanyl at the border. And that means giving the president new authority to shut down the border. My opponent opposes that bill for only one reason. The leader of his party told him. I mean, this is another career politician, election year epiphany from Punxsutawney Bob, who comes up every six months before every election. I mean, under three and a half years of the Biden-Harris administration, there was nothing done on the border. 
And Pennsylvania is not just a battleground for the presidency and for the Senate, but also the House of Representatives. There are Democrats trying to take some Republican-held seats there, as well as Republicans trying to take some Democrat-controlled seats. But arguably, it's a more important state for House Republicans because they are endangered on the east and west coast. So the ability for them to pick up some Pennsylvania seats could be a lifeline to save their House majority. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weisskopf, NTD News. In Nebraska, people with felony convictions will be able to register to vote. The state Supreme Court's issued the decision today. Nebraska Secretary of State sought to keep about 7,000 people with felony records from voting. The court ruling today says that the Secretary of State had no authority to strip voting rights from people convicted of a felony. This could potentially add hundreds of new voters to the rolls. They have until October 25th to register. Nebraska overall is heavily Republican, but the state divides its electoral college votes by congressional district. The second congressional district centered around Omaha is a toss-up and has voted both ways in recent elections. The Harris campaign and Democratic groups have spent millions there to secure the precious electoral vote. With less than 20 days until November 5th, congressional leaders prepare for the election after the general election. Lawmakers from both parties will elect their new congressional leaders once Congress reconvenes. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on this story. Just one week after the general election, lawmakers in the House of Representatives are expected to vote on the leadership of both parties for the 119th Congress. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson hopes to keep his majority in the House, keep his speakership and also keep the favor of the leader of his party, former President Donald Trump. What he's talking about is the things the American people care about. This FEMA dollars going to resettle migrants, that is a fact. I mean, that is an objective fact. Congress appropriated 20 billion additional dollars to FEMA. I just checked, Margaret, as of this morning, less than 2% of that funding has actually been distributed. Right around FEMA, as its name implies, should be working on federal emergency management, not resettling illegal aliens. Johnson has defended former President Donald Trump's rhetoric and has even pinned a picture of himself with Trump on his social media for the last month. Johnson's ambition to keep his speakerships are an uphill battle. Speaker Johnson had 82 Republicans vote against his continuing resolution to extend government funding until December 20th of this year, and 112 Republicans voted against Speaker Johnson's omnibus bill for fiscal year 2024. Democrats are pressing Speaker of the House Mike Johnson to call Congress in early to approve supplemental funds for government agencies, something fiscal conservatives oppose. We're going to be going to the Congress. We're going to need a lot of help. We're going to need a lot more money. But we need Congress to act swiftly to fund FEMA and specifically its disaster relief fund. And why leave up to chance when we can ensure that FEMA has the resources it needs, and especially when a lot of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are working at politicizing these storms when we can actually do something about it. On the Democratic side, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries is unchallenged by the Democratic caucus. House Democrats have voted consistently with the leadership. If Democrats flip the House on November 5th, Jeffries could become the first ever African-American Speaker of the House. Republicans and Democrats are slated to vote for their leadership on the week of November 12th. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The U.S. Senate race in Texas is in the spotlight. Republican Senator Ted Cruz faced off against Democratic Congressman Colin Allred in their only debate last night. And in my view, you know, Congressman Allred is happy to talk about those who committed acts of violence on January 6th, but you don't hear him talking about the Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots that burn cities across this country. If you commit an act of violence, you should go to jail, and there should be no political favoritism in that regard. But Senator Cruz just called himself pro-life. You're not. You're not pro-life. It's not pro-life to deny women care so long that they can't have children anymore. It's not pro-life to for force a victim of rape to carry their rapist baby. It's not pro-life that our maternal mortality rate has skyrocketed up by 56%. That's not pro-life, Senator. Congressman Allred has voted to tell you, a mother at home, you have no right to know if your daughter's getting an abortion. That's an extreme position. And I can tell you the... The closely watched race would help, could help determine which party wins control of the Senate. Democrats view Texas as one of their few potential pickup chances this year. And Cruz has urged Republicans to take Texas seriously amid signs he is in another competitive race to keep his seat. 
Cruz sought to link Allred to Vice President Harris at nearly every opportunity during the debate. Allred in turn hammered Cruz over the state's abortion ban. The ban is one of the strictest in the nation with no exceptions for rape or incest. The critical swing state of Georgia saw a record-breaking number of ballots cast yesterday on the first day of early voting. Here's more on that story. More than 300,000 voters in Georgia already made their choice for the November election on the first day of early voting Tuesday. That's according to the Secretary of State's office. It said the previous first day record was just 136,000 in 2020. For many early voters, this election is critical. It's coming in the aftermath of a destructive hurricane, as well as a number of polarizing changes to how elections are to be held in the state. I think this is an existential election. It's going to have implications for my children and my three grandsons and more to come. So it's critically important that everyone at least voices their vote. I was just affected by the hurricane that came through. So um, just seeing the person I voted for and how they've reacted to everyone, I mean, affected by that and supported everyone, um, that was the main reason I voted for them today. Georgia is at the top of the list of states to watch this election. In 2020, President Biden defeated former President Trump by less than one percentage point. It was the first time a Democrat won the state since 1992. Georgia's 8 million registered voters could be key to deciding who the next president will be. A Georgia judge ruled Monday, election officials will have to certify results by the statutory deadline. This is regardless of whether they suspect any irregularities or fraud. This year, that deadline is 5 p.m. on the Tuesday after the election. The judge's reasoning behind this decision is that election superintendents could not, in his words, play investigator, prosecutor, jury, and judge. He added that superintendents could seek additional information on any votes from the elections board, but any delay in receiving such information cannot be a basis for refusing to certify the results. In a separate decision, the judge also blocked a rule that would require ballots to be counted by hand. He reasoned that the implementation of this rule would lessen public confidence in election results. He said poll workers would be handling ballots in, quote, a manner unknown and untested in the era of ballot scanning devices. With three weeks to go for Election Day, more than five million Americans have already cast their early ballots. That's according to a tracking tool run by the University of Florida. Multiple polls currently show Vice President Harris in the lead nationally, but Trump is gaining ground. Joining us now to discuss the record early voting turnout in Georgia is Jenny Beth Martin, co-founder of Tea Party Patriots and conservative commentator who's based in Georgia. Jenny Beth, thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you again. To begin, Georgia just broke a record for first day of early voting in the state. What's the feeling there on the ground? Any word on what people are saying about why they're voting early? Well, I think that what they have learned is that anything can happen and they just want to make sure they have cast that ballot and that it is in the system. So I'm really glad to see that the numbers are so high and uh, they voted in quite quite a few more people voted today. I believe there are around 198,000 who voted when you combine the early voting with um, the absentee voting, they're at over 520,000 people who've cast ballots so far in Georgia. In Georgia, um, maybe unlike some of the other states around the country, there is a real culture of voting early, much more so than voting by mail. So there have been about roughly 275,000 ballots that uh, have been requested by mail. So the traditional absentee ballots. But in Georgia, a lot of people go and vote early. So I'm not surprised by the number. And it, it winds up really helping the people like our super PAC and other super PACs and campaigns. You know, OK, these people have all voted already. Now we just focus on the ones who have not voted, making sure they get out the vote. Now, this enthusiasm, if you will, seems to be part of a broader trend. A national NBC poll from earlier this month finding about 50% of registered voters said they plan to vote early. How do you read this trend? What's behind it? Well, I, I think right now what people are seeing it is there's a big push on both sides of the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats, to vote early. And so they're going ahead 
and and doing that. And I think it's just a, a slight shift from how we used to do things. I I personally would prefer a single day of voting, but the system is what it is. And sin, since it is the way it is, I think that voting early makes more sense for a lot of reasons. It really helps the campaign sort out who are those final voters that, that need to be vote need to vote. Um, but I think also there just there are a lot of people who want to know I've taken care of that I've gotten it done it's marked off my list and now I can go on about my life and do other things getting ready for Halloween and getting ready for Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. Now the 2020 presidential election was a tight race given how close the candidates are polling right now especially in the critical swing states how close do you see this year's race being. I think the country is so sharply divided and people who vote Republican always are going to vote Republican and people who vote Democrat always are going to vote Democrat by and large. So the campaigns are focusing on that middle area with the people who might fluctuate from one party to the, the next. And that's really where a lot of the energy and the effort is when you're working to get out the vote. Also, there's a lot of energy and effort making sure that people who maybe vote in some elections, but not all elections, also vote and that they vote this time. So there's a lot of energy on that. I think that we're sharply divided. I, I, if I, and I don't think that that's going to change on November 5th. I think we're still going to see that the country is divided. I think Trump has the momentum going in his favor right now, and Kamala Harris does not. With that said, I think it's very important to remember that in 2020, then President Trump received the most votes of any sitting president ever in the history of our country. And that still was not enough for him to be declared the winner officially. And so even with all of those votes, it was not it was not enough. And I point that out and I say that because I think that it's very important for people who want to see Trump win. You've got to be involved. You've got to be active. Go volunteer on the campaign. Don't take anything for granted. And one more thing, if I may, the Democrats began doing something called relational organizing back in 2018. They really improved upon that technologically in 2020. And uh, now Senator John Ossoff uses te technology to help get out the vote with friends and family and increase voter turnout by 3.8%. Other groups on the left have used similar technology to increase voter turnout up to 9.2%. I believe that same technology was used in 2022. And that's part of the reason why the polling showed Republicans were going to do very well. But on election day, it kind of... Um, it, we, it wound up being much more split 50-50. Well, our super PAC and a few other super PACs and groups are now using technology that does that same kind of relational organizing so you can figure out which friends and family are most important for you to reach. And I think that's going to help level the field with, with getting out the vote. But that is a very powerful tool that the left has been using. And it, I think it helped them in 2022. And we have to make sure we're doing the same on our side. Speaking of getting involved, parts of the Peach State are still reeling from Hurricane Helene, but election officials in Georgia say absentee ballots were sent out as scheduled and the storm did not impact that process. Have you seen or heard anything in terms of how the storm impacted voting in other ways? Well, I, there are people who have been displaced, people who did not have power for a little while, people who are very focused on taking care of their homes after their homes have been damaged or destroyed. So they're, they're very focused on other things other than the elections. The power got back up in Georgia for maybe not for every single house, but overall the grid was back up within a week of the tour of the hurricane going through the devastation in Georgia for each individual who was affected was was enormous. So I'm not downplaying the enormity of what they are facing. And overall, in the entire seat, it was not like what North Carolina expected in Georgia. We were tracking the storm for a week or for almost a week before it hit. And North Carolina did not anticipate getting the amount of rain that they got. So they were caught a little more off guard. 
Also, ballots had not gone out in Georgia. They went out in Georgia after the hurricane went through. So we don't, didn't have loose ballots around anywhere. And I, I know that, that both campaigns and the Secretary of State's office, and I'm sure by both campaigns, I mean, I'm sure that the Kamala Harris, as well as the Trump campaign and the Republican Party, as well as the Democrat Party in Georgia are working to make sure that voters are not disenfranchised and that they are able to vote. And the Secretary of State's office is doing the same and the nonprofit groups are as well. So I think people will be able to vote. They may wind up voting at a different place than they normally do, but they're going to vote. Early voting has begun, and it is not something new in Georgia to vote early, so they, they know they have that option as well. And Jenny Beth, in terms of changes to election rules since 2020, in your view, what are some of the most significant changes or potential changes? Well, I think one of the most significant uh, uh, changes in Georgia is the fact that when you request that mail-in ballot, the absentee ballot, you have to include a voter ID number. It's not just matching a signature any longer. It's also the voter ID number. I think that's one of the most important changes that happened. Also, there, there have been other changes related to drop boxes. We've seen, and you were just reporting on changes to to counting ballots at the end of the day that the judge just recently ruled and I, I said could not happen. Um, but I, the election in Georgia, the changes that have happened, especially legislative changes that have happened, have improved the situation from where we were in 2020. One other major, very, very important change is that the money that was flowing into the state and into election boards in 2020 from Mark Zuckerberg, which have been called Zuck Bucks, those are no longer allowed in Georgia unless the Secretary of State approves it. So the money can't just be given to one side of the aisle or one left-leaning county over another, over another county. And some of that was happening in 2020, and it was a lot of money. And then those local election boards kind of build relationships outside of the the relationship they should be happen, having, which is to their voters and their taxpayers. So I'm glad that money has been eliminated. The signature changes have happened. The drop box changes have happened. And those are all major improve, improvements from where we were 20, in 2020. Yes, there are more changes that I want to see happen and other people are working on election integrity want to see happen. Change takes time and sometimes it's slower than we want, but we do have significant changes in Georgia that some of the other states were not able to implement. Jenny Beth Martin, co-founder of Tea Party Patriots and conservative commentator, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. With Election Day only less than three weeks away, a judge in Georgia blocked a measure that requires all ballots to be counted by hand. The decision came after a ruling that demands election officials to certify all results by November 12th. Entity's Sam Wong was in D.C. to find out what the people had to say. How do you feel about not finding out the result on Election Day? I think it's very important for democracy that every vote is counted. And if you're not doing that, then you're suppressing the vote. There's people voting. We need to know the results as soon as possible. I don't think it needs to be done on, the, on election day or even the next day. It might take a few days to get everything counted. I think the results should be reported immediately after election day. It, it allows too much time for questions. I mean, at the end of the day, if you go ahead and report the results, then, then everything is said done. It gives the country opportunity to go ahead and, and absorb what those results are. You can transfer billions of dollars in a matter of seconds and you can't count our votes in a day. I think it would be frustrating just in general to, to not have results at the end of the election day, but I would rather have solid, actual, real results. As much logistics that we have in this country, it's just ridiculous that you can't complete an election in 24 hours. Uh, there is a little bit of controversy right now in Georgia. So they used to have a law that would require the state to count all the ballots by hand just so that they can get, it, get a more accurate count, right? And then now a judge uh, has rejected that decision. So what do you make of that? Modern technology. You know, I mean, there's enough that's outdated. You might as well get up to speed with it. If there's ballots that are damaged in the process of counting through the computer, then that will protect the ones that don't get counted. They shouldn't need to count the ballots by hand. Why should they? 
they have they have their they've had four years to figure out how to count their ballot. The only reason you would cancel something is if you have something to hide. The actual ballots cast had to match the registered voters in Georgia. I don't know that there's any real way that you can do that without hand or personal audit. Generally speaking, the uh, electronic ballots are doing their job. Point blank would rather have verified counts if that means that they want they they need to count them by hand then we should be doing that. Whatever yields the best and most accurate results is what they need to do and if it's by hand count then they need to get enough people to make that happen on election day. That's, that's... Football legend Tom Brady is now an owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. He says he's humbled and excited to have been unanimously approved. Here's the story. Before I get started, I just wanted to talk about seven time Super Bowl winner Tom Brady is now a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. It's great that Tom Brady wants to invest in the NFL. Uh, I think it, um, listen, he, he cares deeply about this game. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell says Brady brings an important perspective to management. They add a lot to uh, the ownership. I, I love not just the diversity of it, but the diversity of thought in the context of. What's good for the game? What can we do better? How do we improve? How do we get bigger? On social media, Brady wrote, it's a blessing to know I'll be involved in the greatest league in the world for the rest of my life. At the same time, thanking Raiders owner Mark Davis for welcoming him in. This has the potential to go bad fast. Football analyst Doug Zarkin says leading a high-performing team is different than building a high-performing team. Tom has only ever looked at the team from the perspective of, is the offense strong? Having to look at all sides of building a team, defense, special teams, coaching, um, royalties that they have to pay, league-generated sponsorships, individual sponsorships. Zarkin says that depending on how active Brady is in ownership, he can see it not going well. And that's all for today's news. For Around the Clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.